And it's interesting, like society is always allowed to make all these observations on uh, well-known people. I, I think well-known people should occasionally make some observations on society. That's why I love working for the Talk House, <laughs> to be honest, is because it seems to be the only site that gives artists a voice to talk about their own perspective. Which is amazing. Hi, this is Nick Dawson, the Editor-in-Chief of TalkHouse Film, and you're listening to the TalkHouse Film Podcast. Now, possibly more than ever, we need strong, smart, inclusive voices, and the ones you just heard belong to two TalkHouse favorites, and total badasses. Perfect pussy frontwoman Meredith Graves, and actress, director, singer, and activist Rose McGowan. Both have been on the podcast before, McGowan talking with American psycho director Mary Harron, and Graves with two of her heroes, Janet Weiss from Slate to Kinney, and punk icon Kathleen Hanna. And pieces McGowan and Graves wrote on, respectively, Scott Bayo and Misogyny, and Andrew W.K., Lana Del Rey, and Authenticity, are among the most read articles ever on the talk house. McGowan and Graves' conversation was recorded live in New York City at Samsung 837, where they impressively adhered to the venue's no profanity rule. There's an incredible power in what they both have to say, though, that has nothing to do with four-letter words. Immediately on the same wavelength, the two had a remarkable, inspirational discussion about McGowan's troubled time in Hollywood, her move into directing, the roots of her activism in early childhood, systemic misogyny, gender hypocrisy, and violence against women, and much more, including a surprising and revelatory detour into their respective feelings about death. They also touch on what's up next for McGowan, her forthcoming No Holds Barred book, her plan to start a female-centric distribution company, and a directorial feature mashing up Jane Eyre, Rebecca, and Gaslight. You are a role model for, for people like me who really have intentions to do a countless number of things with our life and with our time. It's something that I recently heard referred to as being a multi-potentialite. Is the word I heard for that, which is which town like, were you in? <laughs> <laughs> the internet. You're the town of the internet. The vast That's a small wasteland town. of the internet. That's a small town. It is. The multipotentialite curse, which I think is the millennial iteration of the word polymath. Yes, I think that is. Yeah. The po- polymath is polymath. basically what that is. Yes. I was called that the other night and I said, well, yes, which is interesting. And that kind of right there describes the difference between LA and New York. In LA, where I just moved from, I was continually told for years, you need to just do one thing, yeah. one thing only, because you're confusing me. And I said, what? Um, your confusion is not my issue. Yeah, because I was doing this for you. Because I was doing it all for you anyway, <laughs> you person in the office, by the way. Yes. I have a lot of female friends who I talk to about that pretty consistently. One of my best friends is a tattoo artist, and she's also a musician. And she's an illustrator and does all these really incredible things and is good at all of them. And she was explaining the same thing, which is that people really are interested in women doing one thing. And she believes it exists on a continuum from, like, Betty Friedan era sort of housewife stuff, where if women are no longer— if we're no longer allowed to say that women are just supposed to be housewives in the kitchen, then they still have to be one thing. Then what are they supposed to be? You're supposed to be one thing. And and essentially— yeah, for me, I came to the conclusion that it's because you are not a multi-hyphenate or able to do that, apparently, or too scared, or I'm not sure what, but don't your problem isn't my problem. And it took a long time for me to get to that point. I feel like it also has a lot to do with capitalism and specialization. Which is the world I was lost in. Right, exactly. It's that, it's that idea of being lost in the means of production. So Correct. Because survival is so expensive— we're not allowed to curse. <laughs> Survival is really, really expensive. Exceedingly. And the, being in the creative arts is almost a guaranteed one-way ticket to Food Stamp Island unless you are in the negative 1% of people that actually manage to make a living out of it. I'm in the negative 1%, but I've been uh, switching from acting to not doing that at all mm-hmm. really has been quite uh, – has made a difference in that world too. And your first short film went off like gangbusters. So moving into the world of directing was riotously successful for you. It it was, and that was, you know, intended. <laughs> so that's good. Um, now I crafted, you know, I crafted a film that was seventeen minutes, and it, you know, it sucks. I wish there was some kind of thing that wasn't short film, long film. It's just a film, and it's the exact length I wanted it to be, mm-hmm. which was only that long. And it's a full three acts. It's called Dawn, and you can watch it on YouTube because I put it up. I wanted to promote thought and uh, ideas for free. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a really, it was a cool process, and I, 
I just finally felt like I was wearing pants that fit me for the first time. That's a great way to put it. I was very uncomfortable for a very long time. What made you feel like directing was the next step for you? Because you do so many things. Well, it wasn't so much that it was the next step. It was just I f it finally clicked that all of the information and years I'd been working on sets, gathering information and studying and learning, um, largely from other people's mistakes, to be honest with you. I... Uh, I decided, I was like, oh, I like the total, I love the totality of filmmaking. I'm not, I don't, for me, being one part of it, but having no voice, literally no voice. Because, and I've said this before, but everything that came out of my mouth for about 17 years was something a man wrote for me to say, mm -hmm. which is very strange. Very strange. Mm -hmm. And I basically finally snapped. Which I think happened some years ago, but it took a long time to kind of, come to fruition in terms of me wanting to deal with it externally with the public. Mm -hmm. It was a private change. I had a lot of brothers and sisters and a father's health care and various things that I had to deal with. And, um, and uh, like a lot of us, we have reasons we do things and they're not known to the public, you know, and there's a lot of stuff with the activism, which I've done since I was a child, like three. Mm -hmm. I've been handcuffed to more courthouse railings than I can count by my parents, and then I took up the mantle myself. But I did it privately because I was always really embarrassed. The idea that I was sold as was so far removed from who I was that I knew it would get tainted by that. And so I kept that very private until it was time that enough time had elapsed that I could just do whatever I wanted and no longer cared. And also the advent, obviously the internet culture has totally changed and made that feasible because it's no longer what you're being sold as. That, that can't wrap you anymore. And I do wish more actors and actresses and, and other people in the media would understand that. That it's their life. It's their art. And the thing is, in, um, in L.A., you're definitely... It's drilled into you that you're a commodity, not an artist. And so to be oftentimes an artist, or not around other artists, is very difficult. Hmm. That's a really striking image, the idea of there being so many artists in L.A. and yet being the only artist in a group of products, effectively. It's like trying to suss out the one apple in a grocery store full of cheeses. It's like, what in here is actual sustenance? Like, what will, what will sustain me? How do you make friends in a culture like that? Or is that why you're in New York? I did not. You did not? Um, I had, I, I mean, I'm friendly with people and I have friends mm -hmm. in LA, but they're not. Um, the only two friends that I had really in the industry were much older actors and they both died. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't out of disliking anybody and not getting along with people. It's fine. It's just not a language that I spoke. And I think that's partially because, and I don't know how you came into it. Everyone seems to come into it in their own way, but I was discovered. So I never um, developed this, ah, I've got, I must do this. Mm -hmm. You know, I have this burning hole to be famous or whatever that is. And for me, I found it to be quite a shock to my system. And so the only thing I could do was just wear a crazy naked dress with a big middle finger sticking up. I was discovered in a way also. And I never specifically was like, I would love to be in a band that gets to travel the whole world and puts out a bazillion records. That would be exactly what I want is to be photographed. Like I, I had no concept that that was you even an no option concept. for me. I didn't know that was even an option for me because uh, they, to be all DJ Khaled about it, they don't want you to know that that's an option for you especially because they really do want you to be one thing from birth. What would you have done if not this? I really, I always knew it was going to be this. That's the you thing. You don't have like a secret passion for, for molecular physics? Well, it's you're my sister's a rocket scientist. Really? And my brother's a material science engineer. And so maybe I do have a pa passion for molecular <laughs> physics. Um, I, I actually, I really wanted to, um, to work with the dead. Mortuary sciences. Uh, mortuary sciences, but more importantly, I wanted to work at a place called the Body Farm in uh, West Virginia. That's where I wanted to go. Is that the place where they take the it's bodies a, to be used in police stuff? In science, for science. Yeah, they, they like donate leave their them out in fields and right, shit. Yeah, exactly. I know about that. And so my first job was at a funeral home moving bodies and, and stuff when I was um, mm -hmm. just maybe just before 14. Mm -hmm. And I got the job because I had this punk friend that was living for free in this top floor attic. There's this weird law in, the East Coast, I mean the West Coast, I think, uh, where you can live for free if they have an attic on a funeral home. And my friend mm -hmm. somehow scammed that one. And he's like, I need help moving bodies. I'm like, why not me? That's great. And uh, I found it very peaceful. And I found it um, in contrast to my life, uh, which was oftentimes very antagonistic just because of how I looked, how people always reacted very strongly to me. 
oftentimes negatively. Um, I found it quite soothing, and I thought that that would be a world to go into where I couldn't really be harmed. And I yeah. wound up in a very different world where I was harmed. I actually, I live in a funeral home right now. I live, I I live back up above to a, a cemetery. Home. I back up to Here a, in New York, in yeah. your new place? Yeah, yeah. Was that a conscious decision? Yeah. It was. You, you, I, you were affected by the peace of being around Completely. There. Yeah. There's about 5,000 people buried in this very small cemetery. And uh, that's very funny. I, I find it very soothing. And it's like kind of a weird form of home nostalgia. When I was a runaway, I used to sleep in funeral homes. And sure. I've always just felt quite safe there. And um, not that, you know, it's not a morbid thing. I don't see why people have such a problem with death. Death frankly. isn't implicitly morbid. That's a really Western so. conceit. It's a very Western very conceit. Western. And I, I think it's very narrow-minded. And I think, I think America has a lot of what I've noticed, just because I'm not from here originally, mm-hmm. is I'm um, from Italy and spent a lot of my working time, except for when I was on a TV show, largely working in Europe, Uh, I I find that they have a much greater concept of time, certainly in Eastern religions and and, and societies. Like, they're okay with the cycle. You know, you are just a piece of sand on the great beach of life, and that's okay, whereas a lot of times in very L.A., like, they cannot, there's, it is, we are the masters of the universe, and no, actually, no, you're not. And we need to make something that means we'll be remembered forever. Forever. Like, no, no one has ever done that, ever in the history of anything. Like, ever, we yeah. barely can piece together our knowledge of ancient and archaic civilizations because paper disintegrates and the truth about everyone and everything will be lost to time. There's no more comforting thought in the world than the idea that someday you and every mistake you've ever made will just evaporate. It will just evaporate. What a wonderful feeling. But then again, there's people still being able to co- like go into it online. No, I'm just kidding. Right. It's, <laughs> no, I think I think it's lovely. I think the idea of just laying somewhere. I have no problem with the idea of being buried. I actually quite like it. I mm. I, I think I like the stillness of it. And I I have no death wish. I'm perfectly down to live a long life. Sure. Same. Yeah. But it's just what it is, you know. And I think there's a beauty in it. And I, it's funny. Nobody wants to talk about it. I've noticed. Not a lot of people want to talk about death. There's actually, uh, my my boyfriend has a very, very interesting friend who's done a lot of humanitarian work around the world. She's been to Syria and Afghanistan and done outreach work in different communities. And she organizes with a few friends of hers something that she calls the death dinners, where she gets people who are very much alive and people who are very much dying along with medical professionals and people from the wow. funeral industry. And just a great assortment of people to sit down over a dinner and to talk about death how it's impacted their lives, their plans for their own death. And it's really an eye-opening experience, like a transformative, almost psychedelic experience for a lot of these people because no one is ever asked to talk about death in a reasonable, practical way. When you turn it into another item on your grocery list. Well, that, but also when you do have, it's very hard. My father was sick for uh, a while and then he died. And it was, he was such a hard man to talk to about, like everything he was so deep, but so terrified and traumatized by what was going on, I couldn't broach it. And now I'm like, why not? Like, go for broke. Like, wh- what do you have to lose? You know, and you definitely, like, especially when you start racking up important deaths, right. you know, right. um, it definitely, there's a sense of loss of what you could have asked for sure. And I think your friend, well, I would like a dinner party invitation is really what I'm trying to say. That's amazing. That's it's interesting. Really we were thinking about hosting thing. one of those dinners. So now that you sure. live in New York, I think you should come. Death also has played into a lot of the films you've made over the years. You've played a killer. You've played a, a dead a person who dies. You've done all of this acting work around death. And sometimes like with the Tarantino films and the Robert Rodriguez films, it's been funny. Has that shaped your concept of your understanding of death in any way? That's an interesting question. I think uh, I always found it insulting when my character died. I'm like, but Mm. I would clearly live. Uh, (laughs) Duh, it's me. I'm supposed to come back. I am the reanimator. It's No, it didn't shape it. My sisters and brothers and my father always had a really bad reaction, understandably, to me getting beat up and dying on film. And I think a lot of it is it because it carries over that man, that creator's anger towards women, and they're putting it on the screen. Mm-hmm. And so there is like a thing of being, you're getting the crap kicked out of you on behalf of somebody else's neuroses and weirdnesses with women. It's pretty lame mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, to be honest. And there's just so many like incidences of violence that go along with the not getting you. Like the other night, there was this guy and he came up to me, he's a big wig at some uh, motion picture company. And he said, oh, you pulled out of this movie uh, for directing. And I said, yeah, the, the, I just didn't like the script, uh, frankly, enough. And... um 
he grabbed my head, which is now shaved, and jerked it all around and then talked to me. And I, I was just kind of stunned. And then I had a big hood on my coat, and he grabbed the hood, threw it over my coat, and, like, proceeded to snap my head around some more. And then I was like, okay, bye. And I'm thinking, like, what kind of man? Like, who are these people? That's the thing. Like, it's why um, would you— it, it is like, and that's just a small example of a consistent kind of treatment that I've gotten along the way mm-hmm. um, for being, uh, for, I guess, being different. I don't know what the option is. Uh, the mm-hmm. other option is um, I tried on some levels at times to play by the rules because I was very scared of being homeless again. That was my, mm-hmm. like, baseline fear. And um, and I managed to tackle that with finally, like, I think I'd figure it out if I was. I would be okay. And that mm-hmm. kind of freed me up. What about you? Did you ever go through, like, super lean times and, and uh, oh, yeah. like, have to fight? You fight the powers while you're in a lean time. It embeds this kind of fear in you in yeah, a lot yeah. of ways. I, I, I mean, I, I have been, I was and remain to some extent embarrassed of the true facts of my life. Um, but I also, as I get older, I'm more open to discussing them because I think it's important to let people know that you can work in this industry and as long as you're willing to eat what's under your fingernails once in a while, yep. then you too can do it. My whole life has been the story of how many things are more important than money. But yeah, age 16 or 17 onwards has been lean times for me. And it has only gotten more exciting and more fun um, since that has happened. I don't want anyone to, I mean, circumstances are circumstances and people are confronted with some tough stuff, especially in a time of such massive divisiveness, massive divisiveness in our inequality. global economy, yeah. of course. So I don't want to be the person that's like, you should want to starve if you really want to make art. And I can't understand people. Like, I, I don't know what they've been going through, of course, but I know that from my perspective, like, yeah, I've I've definitely made those sacrifices. And I just had to have stuff go completely awry a couple of times and have 24 hours to find a new apartment or be told you can either stay at your job or be in a touring band, but you can't have both you do become fearless after a while. Like you, you, you are resilient, not, you become resilient when you don't have a choice. You cannot choose to be resilient. You are resilient when you bounce back from circumstance over and over and over continually. When you show yourself to have that, resilience is a consistent property. Of course. Yeah, but it has to initially come from from incident, I think. I, I don't know about that. I actually don't know about that. I was born into a cult, and I would say by age three and a half, they would come and sit on the end of my bed, and they would say, Rose, if you let God into your heart today, and I would say, no, not today. Maybe ask me tomorrow. And I was resilient and rebellious and pushed back from a very early age, and I, I saw the writing on the wall, and I knew there was no other choice but to survive. There was literally no other choice. It was very Machiavellian. It was like... It was like the Medici court or the Henry VIII's court. It was like drama and palace intrigue, but just with hippies. You sure. Know? Um, but it doesn't mean that they don't have nefarious and male-dominated instincts and yeah. extremely patriarchal, obviously. Um, and uh, it was it was a weird way to grow up, and I suppose. I don't know any other, but at the same time, if somebody said, would you like this other life? And no life is, you know, everything's a facade from the outside, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And I remember one time being actually at, skipping ahead. I remember I was on the show Charmed, and I was just lost. I was playing somebody else 15 to 17 hours a day for five years. I only got to be me and my part-time, and I was tired all the time. So it was only, like, kind of my worst version of you myself. You didn't even get to be the me that you liked. I was not the me that I liked. Yeah, that's the worst feeling all. in the world. It was, it was really, really difficult. And I said, so what happens if I quit? And they say, we'll sue you. If you work at Rite Aid, we'll garnish your wages for all time. You'll never work in this town again. You'll never do this. And, of course, you know, you see a crew of 150 people who all have a job because of you, and you don't want to quit. But at the same time, just not something that, for me, that was, it was very difficult. And it took me a long time to snap out of this kind of character in a way. And I remember one night at 7-Eleven, the guy behind the counter was like, right as I had had, just had the thought of, I think I'm the loneliest person in the world. The guy behind the counter says, you must have the best life. And it's all just total perception, Mm -hmm. you know. And it's um, neither of which are probably true, but very, like, real at the same time. And it's a really weird, you know, I dealt with society uh, as always an outsider of society, uh, very much so. Um, When you're well-known, as I was before I I spent, like, some years deconstructing that, um, it's all ideas of you, you know. And pre-Twitter or 
Facebook or anything like that. Uh, I mean, that was wrong, but you couldn't, there was no self-representative. It was only how somebody wanted to cover you in the media, which is usually covered by a guy or a girl with a mission and a, mm-hmm. and a job to couch you in a certain way. And that was usually in the most one-dimensional way that they could understand, which is tits up. It's that old Hollywood machine of sort of like arranged marriages and what's Elizabeth Taylor doing today? It was really crazy. Has success spoiled Rock Hudson? Has success, in fact, spoiled Rock Hudson? Yes, I would say it did. I think I just got lost in this. I just got lost in this weird PG world. like Because of the show. Because of the show, Mm -hmm. largely. And it was just, I dressed like some, I mean, you know, for five years, you're wearing stuff straight. You're wearing stuff you wouldn't normally wear, talking to people you wouldn't talk to, Mm -hmm. doing stuff you wouldn't do. And it's, very, very hard to like, it took a lot, you know, a car accident, my dad dying, I was paralyzed in my right arm. It took all these things to like get me literally out of this life. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful for them. Not my dad dying, but I'm grateful in retrospect for, it took so much to snap me awake because I was Mm -hmm. so alone in that world. I'm writing a book right now, actually. I'm starting it. It's called Brave. Fiction or nonfiction? Nonfiction. Nonfiction. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's kind of, uh, it's an early overview of my life and then about what Hollywood stole, what I took back, and how you two can be brave mm-hmm. in your own life. And these stories that you're talking about, about things that happened to you on the set of Charmed and instances you've had, like the one you had the other night where the guy touched you without your permission, which I'm which still— Which is the mildest thing that's happened to me, by the way. It always—yeah, people— And that's a daily thing. We've become so—as our society has become so, like, industrialized— we think of human touch as being horrific only in the context of like war Correct. and rape. And it's, it's violence like, is very subtle. Violence is incredibly it's, it's, subtle. It's subtle. Physical subtle. violence is subtle. That's what I'm talking about. Psychic and, and uh, physical violence is very subtle. It's mm-hmm. big and it's subtle at the same time. And I don't think people think of that there's a lot of gray areas in, in male and female violence. Mm-hmm. Pa- the patriarchy is one big violent gray area a lot of the time because it's what prevents you from speaking up. Right, which I'm no longer prevented by because I actually sure. don't even care. Like, yeah, because you're, you're off on a thing. I'm like, what are you going to do, fire me? <laughs> Good luck. Good luck, dude. And I choose not to be. And then someone's like, yeah, this, this agent. And I'm like, yeah, but they cannot hire you. I'm like, I don't want them to. Right. And do you find— And that's how they keep you in the fear. Like, yeah, but they cannot hire you. That's an implicit threat. By it. That was like someone who represented me. And that's like a veiled, and that's a constant thing. And that's just like, you know, they won't hire you. They won't do this. You have to do this, little girl. Stay in line, little girl. Act pretty, little girl. Act pleasing. Don't cause a fuss. You're the type that would cause a fuss, so you better not cause a fuss because all eyes are on you to cause a fuss. You know, and I mean, look at one on a rider. She got arrested for shoplifting. Meanwhile, That was my favorite thing that ever happened. You have, yeah, but meanwhile, like, for, it, like, killed her career for a very long time. And you have people like Robert Downey Jr. who, like, had guns and drugs in his car and uh, broke into someone's house and, like, woke up in a kid's bed. And, and that's fine. Yeah. Not saying it's not fine. Uh, I'm just saying that's, like, there's, there's very clear illustrations of who gets by with, with what. And, yeah. And it's not the girl. No. And that needs to change. You know, there's this great axiom that I always touch on when I have a friend who's going through something like this, which is this idea that if you always tell the truth, you'll never have to remember anything. You'll never have to, like, keep track of anything if you're just constantly telling the truth. But when women tell the truth, you have situations like— um, or when women aren't allowed to tell the truth when they're when they're stay in line, little girl, you get Britney Spears shaving her head and smashing in windows Correct. with an umbrella. You get Amy Winehouse dying. Dying. You get Amanda Bynes— throwing bongs out of a hotel window at cops, and everyone goes, where did, where did this come funny. from? She was such a good girl. And it's like— yeah, That's why. Trust me. Yeah. Like, Britney Spears, like, that. my best girlfriend hung herself, and before she did it, she shaved her head off. And right. I was, you know, when Britney Spears, and I remember, you know, I was living in L.A. during that culture at the mm-hmm. time. It was so insane. It was a good day if I was uh, only paparazzi three times in different areas, like, a day, and, which felt like basically a mugging. Uh, but like, you know, like I would pull up my car to park and all of a sudden the door gets thrown open and there's cameras flashing inside of my car in the face and you're you're just, you're being hunted. And that was like, that was really during like a high point, like 2010, 2011, 2012, or like 2011, like Lindsay Lohan era that Mm -hmm. changed pop culture there so greatly, you know, and Britney and, um, and her troubles, but that girl, I mean, you see early videos of her. She was so heavily sexualized, such a young age, never allowed mm-hmm. to develop anything. So you become a bot person, and then you snap, you know? And frankly, I'm really proud of her for surviving uh, 
against all odds, really, because you're a machine and they want to make a lot of money off of that ass. Mm -hmm. But I got asked things like on Howard Stern, like, show me your labia. Forced sure. to go on there by the studio, which is like a force of rape. You know, for a version of that, like, there's 44 million young male listeners. You have to go on Howard Stern. Well, he's like the whole time, show me your breast. Tell me what your labia looks like. Are you what job in the world does that happen? Mm -hmm. And how much more money do you think Howard Stern none. made in his heyday than— Oh, a ton. The, —than the I actresses who do the work? Of course, yeah. I think that's another thing— But um, it's not even about money at that point. It's, like, literally, like—and you have to sit there. I forgot all—I blocked those things out, and an interviewer mm -hmm. recently told me he'd watched some old interview, and, and when he brought up those things, I actually started to cry, and right. I, was, I was just so, like— That's PTSD. It's, it's total. I have, it's absolutely I have, um, PTSD. Amy, the movie, gave me, like, huge PTSD. I still haven't watched it for that reason. It gave me a lot of PTSD. Yeah. And then, weirdly enough, the next morning I came out of a building, a hotel, um, and not a, I, I, I don't know what the areas are in New York, but I was surrounded by like 30 of them, like all of a sudden. And it was like the very next morning after seeing it. And it, you should see it. I, I feel like, honestly, it's the proper funeral for her. Sure. And I think that it, that movie is um, for anybody who's ever enjoyed one of her songs, they owe it to her to see her properly mm -hmm. and to see what an artist that we're missing. I was obsessed with her. I was sidelined when she died. I, I still think it's one of the greatest losses. It's a huge I loss. I think in time people will come to realize it's even more of a loss than we've That's why I want them to see this movie. Right. It's an incalculable loss, and it's a huge loss of art. You know, I was actually thinking about the AIDS crisis yesterday, and I was thinking about the incalculable loss of art by so many artists that died during that period that we're missing, and I think could so our society could be totally different right Arthur now. Arthur Russell, Joey Arias, Klaus so many, Nomi. so many people, so many people that died um, that we don't even know about. You know mm -hmm. that could have like really changed society, and because there's a whole generation gone, like right now in the last like 20 years, we've really paid the price for it, and I think that's how things have gotten so mainstream. Mm -hmm. We're missing adults in the conversation now too. You know, there's there's there used to be like Bruce Springsteen, Patty. These were adults. We're also I be, I believe I would argue that we're preventing our pop stars from being adults. Oh, completely preventing because, them because being we're, adults. we're not allowing them to grow up. You're marketing them so early and twisting their brains, and everybody has to write for you, right. and this person has to create, and it's the same producer of like six different artists that are all on like you and know. And then he's a rapist. Know Ariana Grande is a rapist. Oh, and they're rapists. <laughs> yeah, yeah then Doctor Luke. We've Luke, got that Luke. whole situation. We've got that whole situation. Kelly Clarkson says he's not a salient person. I am so doing so much better than I thought I would about not swearing. I know. I Kesha, actually I come got, close a couple times, but I've been doing. We both dropped at least I was like, one. Uh, uh, but yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah, we did. We did. But it's okay because if I hadn't said anything, no one would know that. Oh, thank. You. Anyway, anyway, you've got th these men in positions of power are preventing women from growing up. Britney okay. Spears. Britney Spears, Not a Girl, Not Yet a Woman, is the most frightening song that's ever been released on mainstream radio because it's the nexus of her career. And now we have these producers who are men two, three times the age of the women that they're creating, right. as if we need men to create us as musicians and artists. Exactly. Lana Del Rey sexually assaulted by her producer when he made her live in a trailer in New Jersey. We've got Kesha and Dr. Luke. We've got, we've got every woman that's been brave enough to for step forward. I am. I can't wait for your book. I can't wait to read this. Does it name names? I'm going to. You're, are you in a place where you're, you're feeling yeah, like it's I literally good for don't you to name names you don't care I don't, I don't care. These people did these things, mm -hmm. and they do not deserve protection. They all act like it's this like, kind of white male mafia that everybody's joined. I didn't join your mafia. You didn't right. ask. Right. And good, you think I'm going to keep your secrets? Suck it. <laughs> Suck it. Well, okay, so let's talk about this because I, I want to get back to your, your movie um, because I've watched it a few times and I'm a big fan. Thank you. We don't really know as viewers what happens to your main character after, I mean, I, I figure listeners will probably have seen it, and if not, they should, so I don't feel that bad being all about spoilers, but it's implied that she dies. Does she? We don't know. Um, is that a continuation of that theme? Which, because it's, it, it involves a clash between characters of multiple genders, is it the story of a young, innocent girl being taken advantage of or is it a story of a girl making a choice? And is it, in that way, a metaphor for the story of your career in Hollywood? It's and a complete metaphor happened? for my career. I thought so. So this is what metaphor. I want to talk about. Yeah. And it's a metaphor of like a, a very, like I had a relationship with this director. It's a metaphor for that. It's mm -hmm. a metaphor for a lot of that stuff. And it's definitely, you know, what they don't show is me walking off into the woods and going into a clearing. In real life. But maybe if that's the story, then maybe your character doesn't die at the end. That's the thing. 
But my direction to the male actor was really, you are a predator. You are, you are basically like, she's a mouse and you're the king cobra and you're hypnotizing her and that's what predators do. Mm-hmm. And it's been done to me and it was done by Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And the predator of Hollywood really did some hypnotic work that even me, but I was alone. I've been alone. I was alone in Hollywood since I was 15 years old. That town raised me. or I was raised in the shadow of it. Mm-hmm. And I was raised by, it wasn't like one person. It was all of them. And the women supported it too. Mm-hmm. You know, I would say like misogyny is deeply embedded in men and brainwashed into women. And the women there were oftentimes just as treacherous as the men mm-hmm. and certainly helped, helped that treachery along, you know, and uh, to like a really cataclysmic level mm-hmm. and a really like disgusting, like foul level. Like I, mm-hmm. I would say to those women, like, look at yourself, look at your life. What are you doing? Sure. And they don't help other women largely. Sure. I think all of us could be so much more awesome, and I, I feel bad, not super bad, but I feel bad for the box men get put in. I, I mean, I just think, God, aren't you bored? Like, having to think that way yeah, a lot of, of the time. Aren't you bored? Once you stop vying for a seat at their table and you decide to go sit at a different table over here, they're like, well, why didn't you ask me to come to that table? Right, and I will. I will happily ask them to come Absolutely. to that table. Absolutely. You just have to know your— you just, table have to, manners. you just have to know your goddamn you table, have to have table ma- manners. Oh, geez. Your table manners and don't snap my, you know, hood over my head. <laughs> and don't reach over and eat off my plate. Cuz yeah. we've been starving over here because you've been waiting for your food. Starving. So we're starving. Starving. Yeah. If you want to come to our table, bring some food from yours and don't eat off my yeah. damn plate. And we can it, it's everyone can eat. There's everyone can eat. There was there was a male director that but if the job gets given to a woman director, then that's taking one away from the man. Like, how many times have we heard that argument in relation to race? Mm -hmm. I go back to, like, what movies are doing, um, the Hollywood, you know, industrial complex. These, I know those players, and these are not thought leaders, and they're putting out thoughts for the world, how we see race, Mm -hmm. how we uh, see women. And I know these guys, and I would put forward that they are not the ones, you know, who should be owning this damage. They should not be the architects of this Mm -hmm. doom. And it is, there is a place at the table, and it could be such a, like, a great table and that's what's fun if they would just flip it and look at it in the inverse way of like look at how many options look we how many have. options wow. we have wow I could get to know somebody totally different from me wouldn't I don't that have be to awesome? eat french fries three meals a day seven days a week right so wouldn't you it, is it fear of the unknown I think honestly it's fear that we're going to be better and the reality is it's probably true how terrifying that we're in this world where men are taught to look through a lens of fear Oh well, yeah, and suppress fundamentally, that fear. that's what and push that change. fear down, or fight that fear and react with fear. violence. Right, because they they're not they don't they never had the grace to like develop an emotion. Of course, not all of them, and and but I still see even with the emo- most awake male friends I have, certainly like things that I just see that they the casual entitlement without even being aware of it in any way, and it's not an indictment; it's just what I see. It's and the push it's there. to be the smartest guy in the room, always. Right, it's but that fierce but they, but, line and yet activity. it's like, God, m- give me the confidence of a mediocre white man, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. like it's it's very like, and I say this with white men around me whom I adore, and I have I have a boyfriend, I have brothers. This is not, and this is an indictment of the idea of it. I hate that we have to say that though. I hate Honestly, that I have to say that. It does you're right? I've and, said and that I feel, recently I feel, in an but, interview. But, you know, yeah. what? It, you're right. You're right. When you know, it went to print, I was so embarrassed for it being like people. People call me a misandrist because I've talked yes. very openly about deconstructing through any means necessary that masculinist lens and that paradigm. Yes. And I feel like I'm compelled to remind people that I make music with men. I have a male partner. I've got a dad. I've got a brother. I have the head of my label. I am and integrated with men. I spend completely. arguably more time with men than I do with women just by virtue of what I do for a living and the mm-hmm. industries I work in being male-dominated. I refuse to give up my spot in that industry, and I try my hardest to hold the door open for other women. But the fact of the matter is I'm bilingual. I speak men. And you do too, and everyone in our industry does. I do, like, actively on a daily basis have to attempt to not hate men. Same. On a daily basis. Or fear them. Oh, For me, naturally, it's fear. And For I it's hate fear. that yeah. I fear. Right, right. So I resent that I fear, and on a daily basis, it's a fight. And on a daily basis, I see massive instances all over the world where I should and have a right to that hate. Mm-hmm. But I do not. And I will not, but I have to fight. But it is a goddamn fight. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a pity because I would like to live my life free and clear without having to fight that stuff. Mm-hmm. And we all deserve that. We could we make so much better this. work if we weren't constantly obsessing over our um, selves, if we weren't constantly trying to determine the easiest path through the day. 
It's like a side scrolling video game where you can't like right. I never back. I don't go back to a safe path. spot. No. I, will, I will not take the easiest path. I will always rather my sister even like when I was little. She's like Rose. If you just tell them you believe, it'll be a lot easier for you. Right. It's like, but I don't. I do not believe, and I cannot lie. Mm-hmm. And I think it goes back to what you're saying. Just tell the truth. Just tell the truth and tell it loud. And then you're met with situations where you do tell the truth and people look at you and insist that you're lying. Of course. That insistence that you could not possibly be telling the truth. Oh, Greg Araki, the director of uh, my first movie. Doom Generation. Doom Generation, when I explained in an interview what had happened to me on that set, which was, you know, I learned a lot on that set. It was trial by fire. I, I want to hear how to about be in this. movies. That's a cornerstone film for most people in my position really who is. went through film school. So I'd love to hear about your experience, if you want to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, my experience was that, you know, he's a misogynist. And uh, and when the interview came out, he came out and he said, Rose, mis- it was a long rebuttal to my memory. Uh-huh. of having somebody, a male actor, put a water bottle under my skirt and try to put it into my vagina while squirting water all over it while pretending to F me with the bottle while the director was in the back seat going, oh, children. And he said, I misremembered it. You misremembered it? Yes. It's that... I'm like, my vagina remembers. Right, and we, we trust these you? men because he, he's you? literally a professional crafter of narrative. A professional crafter of narrative who offered no protection because of his own instilled beliefs that women are less than. Mm -hmm. Which, if you ask, of course, he would say no. You're misremembering it. You're misremembering. You wore a short skirt. You deserved it. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? And these arguments are used to justify everything. Everything they've done. The gang rape of a woman in India on a a public transportation to, to Britney Spears. Like... The it's idea a way to totally not look at themselves and let themselves off the hook, which is gross. If you play a hypersexualized character in a film, the director and the other actors on set treat you as a hypersexualized character. Oh, you have character. no idea how it was. It was really disgusting. It right. was dark. And it was um and that character wasn't any more sexual than those men. Right. At but all. the men get to call it like you were talking about earlier, where no one ever wants to talk about actresses in terms of their method. The men get None. that written off as method acting, and they're consumed by their character when they're on set with this oh, film. No, that you didn't get the same. It's in, uh, same not at all. It's an ex- at all. It's an excuse when when a young male actor is like I'm a method actor. I'm like, oh, you're a bully, and you're uh, you're using that as an excuse to abuse women around you, mm-hmm. basically, and abuse crew, which is intolerable to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I won't have that on my sets. I will not have that. I will not have anybody abuse a crew member. I will not have anybody abuse a woman. I just will not tolerate it. And, and ostensibly, the men are making more money to behave that way. Of as course, well, they are. Because and of the fiscal. Disparity. I was almost always tech the number one in the movie, mm-hmm. usually, mm-hmm. but I was always number two on the call sheet. Sure. You know, and that's. But if you went in and said something, you're like, "Is it worth it?" And at the time, I was like, "Oh, it's not even worth it." And then now, of course, I would be like, mm-hmm. "But it wasn't." But it, it's like that's how work gets back to the, you know, that you're not a team player. A team player in what? Misogyny? Mm-hmm. Whose team? Whose team? You didn't invite me to join your team. You didn't invite me. And you yeah. didn't ask, and I wouldn't have come. Exactly. But now that you're directing, now that you're yeah. in a position of greater power, how are you dealing with those situations? Now that you ha- can ostensibly assert more control over situations like that, how are you choosing to deal with it? Well, I mean, there's a zero tolerance. Sure. That would be completely unilaterally not allowed. Um, There's no way I would ever put a girl at risk. Mm -hmm. And certainly, I mean, there's there's so many instances. Like I've worked with so many like men who they had to do a sex scene where they wear they call it a a C O C K. I'm not saying it out loud. The weird naked suits. The naked (laughs) no the sock. But they make the the female assistant stylist put it on them in their trailer because they can't do it themselves. Huh. Welcome to Hollywood, kid. Welcome to you're Hollywood. You're on your knees in front of a man because you're and you're getting paid $85 a day to be an assistant, if that, to a stylist on sex. You want to learn a craft, and that's what you have to do. Right. Yeah, some craft. Some craft. Lord. It's dark. It's a dark place. People don't realize it, you know, and I, I hate to disillusion people if they have any other idea about it. But it's, I think people believing anything other than the truth is disillusionment. I think so, too. Yeah. I find it offensive. I'm like, it's actually the truth. I know. Mm-hmm. I, am, I am ground zero for this. Mm-hmm. I was it. I was the pixel that was sent out to be masturbated to. Mm-hmm. I'm very aware of what's up, mm-hmm. you know, so to, to completely deny my experience— and wipe that away with misremembering. Mm-hmm. Oh no, I've remembered all of it. I've been taking notes. Mm-hmm. I got receipts. I got receipts. Yeah. I paid a lot of price. I paid a heavy, heavy price. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's taken a lot of years to put myself back together. Sure. And somehow you're still here. 
and somehow you're, you're I'm still electing here. to still be part of this. I'm electing. That's I'm happened. electing to actually change society. I'm mm-hmm. electing to push. I'm electing to use a platform that I worked really hard at, even though I spent like the last eight years really disengaging from fame uh, in in that context, um, and to do it on my own terms. I did realize I am essentially a politician of sorts, but I can't be voted out of office. That you can if you're still in the industry, if you're doing it that way. But I think as an artist, you can't be voted out of that. Right. If you're an artist, you cannot be voted out. And uh, therefore, that, that does make me dangerous to them. Hmm. And they are lashing back, believe me. How do we get more money to young women who want to become interested in film? Exactly. How I, do we get more teenage girls feeling like it is within their means to go to school and study film? With the technology we have at our disposal, with tiny cameras in our pockets. We're just going to have to start doing it ourselves. All the time. All the time, relentlessly. How do we get funding to girls? How do we make it so trans actors play trans roles? How do we get people the you just space and the resources to tell their own stories? do it. You wake these people up so they actually have to do it. But short of putting and a bomb us. in their office, how do we get the right. money away from men? Um, how do we I'm, take I'm their jobs really, most effectively? How do I take your job most effectively your job? and do it better? Um, I think, uh, you know, I, th- I think that's the conundrum. And that's, I'm working really hard at that. I would ultimately like to have, you know, one of the things I want to have is my own distribution mm-hmm. company for women and platform for women. Um, not just to sit there and bitch about stuff, uh, which is another term that we largely get stuck with, mm-hmm. um, but to actually, like, do it. And I think if all those women that are deeply brainwashed in Hollywood, they too have access to money. They need to wake up. True. They need to wake up. True. And they are not serving their sisterhood. Final question. If you could remake one thing, what would it be? Uh, I want to take a movie that puts together Gaslight. Um, Classic. The early 30s, right? uh, 40s. 40s, Gaslight. Gaslight, Jane Eyre. Uh, the Mrs. Danvers, uh, the um, Mrs. Rochester character is locked in the top thing. I want to mix a movie of gaslighting, yeah. Mrs. Rochester's and Mrs. Danvers from Rebecca and put all the three women that are all these tropes of that you're supposed to believe they're mad or because they're unattractive, they're not good. Mm-hmm. And I want to change that and flip that on this here. So I actually want to put movies together and all the tropes of women and put it in one movie. Being made by an all-female cast, an all-female production company. An all-female crew. And getting women paid. Word. This is Nick Dawson from Talk House Film, and you've been listening to Meredith Graves and Rose McGowan on the Talk House Film Podcast. This episode was engineered by Talk House podcast producer Elia Einhorn and edited by Mark Yoshizumi. For more filmmakers talking film and TV, visit thetalkhouse.com slash film. Subscribe to Talk House Film and Talk House Music Podcasts on iTunes and Stitcher, where you can find all our previous episodes. And while you're there, please rate and review if you can. All right. All right. We're done, right? Done. We've t- we've said everything two girls can say. Yeah. On this fine Wednesday afternoon. 